This week's number, 46%. That's the share of American men who believe they could successfully land a passenger plane. True story, my grandfather killed 50 German pilots. He was a shitty mechanic. Welcome to Prop G Markets. Today, we're discussing the IPO market, Disney's parks investment, and FTX's suit against Sam Bankman fried's parents. Here with the news is Prop G media analyst and someone who I think would be an outstanding flight attendant, Ed <laughs> Elson. Ed, get me a ginger ale and some peanuts, bitch. <laughs> uh, Did you hear that we just got nominated for a, an award for our podcast, Scott? I literally had not heard that. Say more. You, you know how much that? I'm desperate for other people's affirmation. That's right. I just got nominated for the Signal Award for Best Money in Finance podcast. The Signal Award? What is that? Yeah. I mean, I, they're obviously a clearly <laughs> an outstanding organization <laughs> really with great judgment, in. but who <laughs> are they? They're a spinoff of the Webbies, Scott. Oh, it's podcast. a spinoff spin of the Webbies. So we're the winning again. Spinoff of the Webbies. Oh, yeah. oh my God! So an even even a shorter and shorter small person. I don't want to say midget because I've been reprimanded for that. An even <laughs> no, shorter and shorter, that. vertically challenged small person who believes they can <laughs> land a plane. I'm trying to help me here. Anyways, <laughs> we're nominated. We're not. We're we're going to win the Signal Award. So Pivot won Best Business Podcast. Has Prof G ever won anything? I don't think we've won I don't anything. I think so. I think this is going to be the first one. No Mercy, No Malice won, won That's right. a Webby. Yeah, we won a Webby. Newsletters. You know the last award I won before that? It was in the ninth grade. I won Most Comical. Uh, me and Marlene Gamer, who overdosed from heroin in her 20s. That escalated fast. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I managed to avoid almost all awards for 40 years or 45 years. Most Comical to Best Business Podcast. That makes sense. <laughs> That's right. That makes sense. Well, All right. everyone, please vote for us. The voting ends October 5th. Oh, they can so vote. We'll leave... Where do they yes. vote? Is Let's it www.signal-vote? What is it? What's the name of the site? It's vote.signalaward.com. Go to vote.signal.award.com. Is that what you said? <laughs> vote? Okay, wait. Vote.signalaward.com. Oh, can I fax it in? <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Okay, good. Please vote for us for the... Signal best, <laughs> the signal award for best business podcast. Very excited about it. Oh, all right, enough of this shit. Ed, get to the headlines. <laughs> didn't even read out the URL. All right, we're going to leave it in the, in the comments. Uh, let's start with our weekly review of market vitals. The S&P 500 fell, the dollar rose, Bitcoin dropped, and treasury yields hit 15-year highs. Shifting to the headlines. The Federal Reserve paused its interest rate hiking campaign for the month, holding rates at a 22-year high. Still, a majority of the Fed's board indicated they're prepared to deliver one more increase this year. The Bank of England also held interest rates steady, ending its 14-month streak of increases after UK inflation fell for the third month in a row. Cisco struck a deal to acquire the analytics and security software company Splunk for $28 billion dollars. After this acquisition, Cisco says it will be one of the world's largest software companies. Cisco's stock fell 4%, while Splunk's rose more than 20%. And finally, Rupert Murdoch stepped down as the chairman of Fox and News Corp at 92 years old. Both stocks rose slightly on the announcement. Scott, thoughts? So... I think uh, Chairman Powell loves the kind of the macho. I think he likes... I think he gets in front of Congress and he threatens to rate, you know, hike rates more. And then he goes home and he just has like hot sex with his companion or wife. Because I think that guy likes, I think he just feels his, you know, he feels his riz or whatever it is. He feels his mojo <laughs> when he says to the world, I don't, you know, Senators Warren or, you know, Holly or whoever wants to try and beat up on me for raising interest rates, you know. How do you like me now? We have the lowest inflation of any G7 economy. So I think Agreed. this guy is, you know, I don't think- Which is a guy, compliment to him. Yeah. I don't, I don't think he's scared of anyone. I, don't, I yeah. literally, I, I think he's more inclined to keep raising rates if he feels pressure to, to not raise them. So mm -hmm. good for him. I'm glad that, um, I'm glad we're starting to see inflation come down in the UK. The UK is, I mean, if you look at, 
literally something like two thirds of the stocks that have gone public in the United Kingdom over the last 10 years are below their offering price. The entire mm -hmm. FTSE, the 100 biggest companies in the United Kingdom are worth less than Apple. And just investing in the UK or in the UK stocks just hasn't worked. And I believe it's the only country in the European Union that hasn't grown in the last five years. So the last thing they needed was like a crazy uh, dose of inflation. So I'm glad to see it come down. Uh, for the yeah, at the, at the same time, though, it's still at 6.7%. And you compare that to the US, we're down to 3.7%. Yeah. Um, which, you know, is just more... Another good sign for the U.S. I mean, we, we made this point before, but we're just completely blowing ev all of our competitors out of the water when it comes to fighting inflation. You got France at five percent, Germany at six, Sweden at seven and a half. Um, the U.S. wins here. It's funny to have the have the Brit um, talking up in America, and I'm I'm <laughs> defending, and I'm literally sitting here drinking tea in my new eating, home, eating biscuits. Um, <laughs> yeah, what kind of biscuits? Look, it's all about it's all about momentum and direction, and it's heading in the right direction. So yeah. let's hope that rates keep coming down and Arsenal beats Tottenham. Do you know, Ed, my son won't go to the Arsenal-Tottenham game with me unless we sit in the away section of Arsenal because he's a Tottenham fan? I mean, what the good fuck? Good for him. He's a good know. fan. Uh, it's I respect not like that. that. It's not like he's that vocal at Tottenham games. I mean, come on. Anyways. <laughs> oh, anyway, so i got to find someone to go to the Arsenal game. Uh, anyway, so... Me. Uh, Cisco Systems. Cisco is so interesting. Cisco reminds me that no company, every any company, any company can go down, its stock can go down 90%. Amazon from 1999 to 2001 went down 90%, as did Cisco. And when mm -hmm. the dot bomb implosion happened, no one knew what to do. So everyone thought, oh, go to hardware and infrastructure just to be safe. So the company that was safe was Cisco. Because everybody, mm -hmm. no one knew it. It was run by a guy named John Chambers, who was sort of the, I don't know, the Tim Cook of his era, just was considered the best CEO in tech. And it was like, okay, I don't know where to put my money, so I'll just put it in Cisco. And I think Cisco lost 90% of its value. And Cisco has sort of dropped out as one of the most, and oh, and by the way, Cisco at one point was the most valuable company in the world. Mm. And it is, it, I don't even think it's in the top 10 any longer. I doubt it's, I'm curious. I don't even think, it's, it may not even be in the top 50. Anyways. They needed to do something, and Cisco's, the learning here is that every company, you know, we talked about this notion of core competence. What Cisco was great at is they would kind of map out the technology ecosystem, and, and they would figure out where they were weak, and then they would go acquire companies. And mm -hmm. they were the best acquirer in the 90s, and they just made their corporate development team there was super strategic, super smart, and they'd show up and say, all right, we need some sort of payment technology or the software that does this. And they'd say, congratulations, we're going to overpay, but you're going to fill this hole for us. They did. They built. They were fantastic acquirers. For me, the most interesting story of the last week and last 24 hours is Rupert Murdoch stepping down. Um, uh, one, and this sounds very macabre, I think it means he's dying. I don't think this guy mm -hmm. gives up control unless he is totally unable to participate and He's been out of the public eye, and also he's 92. If I sound ageist, I am, and so is biology. Um, and uh, what's more interesting, though, is that if you look at the corporate governance, there's three kids that are in some sort of trust or have the voting shares, if you will. Um, they control like 40% of the company. It's like 60% is um, common shareholders. Mm -hmm. But anyways, basically the three kids, I believe, control the company. And the two that aren't in the company kind of now, once Rupert is gone, get to decide what happens. And I think this all adds up to one thing, and that is I think that um, Fox gets sold or starts um, mm. disposing of their assets or starts selling them in, again into this larger conglomeration of um, ad-supported cable assets that where they cut costs. So I think that I think the Fox... Uh, and the news core of old that we know and Rupert Murdoch, um, the sun is setting really, you know, you know, when the sun is in the ocean uh, or and it seems like it's an optical, uh, optical illusion, or as my father used to say, an optical conclusion that all of a sudden it looks like the, <laughs> the sun's descent. It starts to, it feels like it starts diving faster. Yep. This is uh, Fox, I believe, um, uh, uh, Fo the Fox as we know it has come to an end, and it's going to be super interesting. There's going to be a ton of 
kind of legacy review of News Corps and um, the the incredible business it is, but also the incredible damage it's done. I just don't think there's any getting around it. I think, I think I don't know if these. I don't. I'm, I'm kind of I have a lot of mixed feelings. I think capitalism's important. It's important to have a dissenting view. I mean, you want to talk about the biggest white space in the world that no one saw except for Rupert Murdoch. Media has a liberal bias. They're usually people who are overeducated and live in urban cities that skew wildly democratic. And there was like this upward spiral, or I should say this leftward inexorable spiral towards more progressive values. And he came in and just said, you know what? Somewhere between 47 and 51% of America is not progressive and no one is talking to them. No one is speaking to them. Everyone's just mocking them and media has totally ignored them. And he created what is arguably one of the most powerful and profitable um, news franchises in history. And he's also spread conspiracy theory, uh, targeted women uh, with coordinated attacks across his properties, Fox. He did it to my co-host, Kara Swisher. He'd done it to some other people. Uh, I really think that they've they've engaged in some, what feels like, for lack of a better term, anti-American activities. Um, but this is going to be, there's going to be a lot of stories about the legacy of Rupert Murdoch. He's definitely a central figure, uh, not only in media, but in American history over the last 20 or 30 years. Any any thoughts yeah. or reactions, Ed? Well, I was just going to say the guy we should talk to about this is my old boss, Michael Wolf, who just came out with a book about this called The Fall. And his conclusion is the same as yours, which is that this is the end of Fox News. And yeah. there are a few great little pieces and anecdotes in that book. But the first one was that Murdoch hates Trump, called him a fool, called him an idiot, yeah. called him yeah. nuts. The second most interesting is that um, he completely underestimated the Dominion lawsuit. Apparently, he thought it was going to cost the company around $50 yeah. million, and it ended up costing close to $800 million. Um, and then, you know, the, the third is this, the same conclusion as yours, which is that Fox News is doomed and that this thing has gotten basically too old and too conservative and that it's in the process of being superseded by this younger, more tech-focused, Twitter-happy, right-wing world. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think he's probably right. The thing that really struck me that people don't talk about in terms of the Dominion suit is I think there's an algebra deterrence that is super important in any society. And it goes like this. The likelihood that you get caught doing something wrong times the fine or the penalty once you're caught has to be greater than the profits you're going to get from continuing in this malfeasance or illegal activity. Mm -hmm. And this is what plagues America in terms of big tech. And that is even if we find Facebook $5 billion, when they look back at all the money they made from um, violating the law and consent decrees, they made a lot more than $5 billion. Yeah. And so it makes sense to continue to break the law and ignore consent decrees and skirt kind of the lines of the law or whatever's good for the Commonwealth because the algebra of deterrence isn't in place. What's interesting here is that the inaccuracies and the impact and the slander and the defamation were exponentially greater on another media platform called Meta. But here's the thing. It wasn't a problem for Meta because Meta is protected by the shield of 230, Section 230, which says that they're not a media company. It says they're a platform and that they aren't subject to content that is on their platform. And here's the problem. That's why News Corps, their anchors go on and their anchors say, okay, we apologize. We got this wrong. And when they have, and they don't have Rudy Giuliani on Fox any longer because like, this guy's crazy and a liar. And he might say something that if we don't immediately refute it, we could get in hot water and it could end up costing us $750 million. But Meta has absolutely no problem using its algorithms or programming its algorithms to elevate crazy novel content because novel content is, wait for it, novel. And so this kind of highlighted the problem. There was an algebra deterrence yeah. that even put some guardrails around Fox, but those guardrails just don't exist when it comes to social media networks. Yeah. But I mean, but even that's a charitable uh, take for Fox. I mean, <laughs> do they really refute stuff that Rudy Giuliani says? I feel like they just completely ignored the guardrails and that's why they're in this situation. I would argue that the damage that 
is done on Meta every day is a mushroom cloud, a nuclear mushroom yeah, cloud yeah. compared to the dumpster fire of Fox. And, the, and, and, and it's a bit of a misdirect because people spend so much time, not so much time, media is obsessed with itself. And all the folks at CNN are obsessed with Fox. And so the folks on TV, the folks in what I'll call the boomer media, the media that a lot of us see, it has a lot of influence because it then gets parsed up and spit out to the machine of uh, social media. They are obsessed with, with Fox and every mistake they make. And every time there's drama at CNN, Fox is obsessed with it. They hate each other. They go after each other. But in terms of what, what I would argue, any sort of journalistic integrity, any sort of fidelity to the truth, uh, Fox lies like crazy. And I mean, and they're fucking Mother Teresa compared to what happens on Meta. I mean, you're, they do, they will push back. When Brett Baer interviews Trump, he asks him very pointed questions. And they do have, I mean, Neil Cavuto is a great journalist. They, you know, I like Liz Clayman. Stuart Varney is, you know, he's, you know, this is Stuart Varney. I, I like Stuart. I think he does a good job with the business news. Now, Tucker Carlson, you know, conspiracy theories, but Tucker Carlson did get fired. So, yeah, the, the, it depends on the ecosystem and the benchmark. But, uh, I mean, for God's sakes, Fox is PBS compared to what happens on Meta or Google or YouTube every day. It's just that we compare them to the traditional media, yeah. and they are, they are much faster and much looser and much more drawn to conspiracy theory because they know. I mean, they, all, they, they were all vaccinated and double boosted, and yet they wouldn't wouldn't, you know, they didn't want to say if they were vaccinated and constantly talking about bringing on people to talk about the concerns and valid concerns about the potential negative impacts of the vaccine because they knew they were throwing red meat at their audience despite the fact that, okay, this might result in hundreds of thousands of unnecessary deaths. I mean, that's the kind of shit they will engage in. But I think when someone comes on and starts just spewing lies, I do think Fox does have some journalistic standards which do not exist in social media. You see, Brett Baer interviewed MBS yesterday. I did not see that. How did that yeah. go? I, I've only looked at a couple of the highlights, but the whole thing was in English. It looked very civil. I, I mean, I'm going to watch the whole thing tonight. Um, yeah, but I, I was, I was super impressed by that. But anyway, this is a markets podcast, so we should move on. Okay, there you go. Um, let's move on to our first story. <clears throat> Marketing platform Clavio went public on the New York Stock Exchange last week. The IPO priced the company at a roughly $9 billion valuation, but the stock popped 23% at the open before retreating to close up 9%. This was the third largest tech IPO in less than a week. The day before, Instacart went public, and its shares popped 40%. And five days before that, chipmaker Arm went public, finishing opening day up 25%. But all three stocks have slumped since their debuts. So, Scott, it seems like we're witnessing a trend here. These companies have a strong pop and then they retreat. What do you make of these results? This is strange. Or I, I've been thinking about this a lot. One, um, yeah. just disclosure, I, I got into the Oddity IPO, super happy. I'm a baller, aren't I a genius? goes from 35 to 55. It's now technically a broken IPO. I think it's trading at, it might even dip below 30 today. But that seems to be what's happening to all these folks is that um, there's a pop, a bit of a run up, and then sooner rather than later, I mean, shit, oddity's down to 27 and a half. And I'm in it for the long term here, and I like kind of beauty meets AI, so I'm going to hold on. But um, what it looks like, just from a market dynamic standpoint, is they have a lot, hot, a lot of hot money. People are buying the IPO, they're not buying the company. And when they don't see yep. a pop, or they don't see like a lot of upward momentum, or they start to see it getting wobbly, they're out. And typically the, the kind of the banker's job is, not, is to find um, sticky money that's in for the long term. And it doesn't appear that that's happening here. It appears that there's a kind of a short-term sugar high. What also appears you know, to be kind of true or evident is that valuations have just come down, that the market is saying these might be great companies, but they're just not worth, they're not worth the valuation the banks are taking them out at and that they're recalibrating down. And I think what that means is moving forward is that the IPOs probably won't get the price they had hoped for. I think there's also a dynamic here 
and our editor in chief, Jason, pointed this out, that the IPO markets are just losing relevance, that the liquidity and valuations companies get in the private markets are now in many ways more appealing than the valuations they get in the public markets. In addition, they don't have yep. the same reporting or administrative costs. So the question then becomes, why go public? And the answer is a lot of companies aren't. Uh, the number of IPOs has declined dramatically uh, over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. Fewer companies, I guess from 1980 to 2000, there were 6,500 IPOs. And then from the turn of the millennium to last year, there were um, fewer than 3,000. So what is that? They're down 60%. And then it used to it used to be a company went public after an average of six years. Now it's 11. Um, and the median market value of a company at its IPO adjusted for inflation was $105 million in 1980. And the median value now is $1.3 billion. Um, so it's just it, it, it just strikes me that the IPO market, kind of the NYSE and the NASDAQ, are the big losers here. And that it also generates a certain amount of income inequality because the public markets used to be an opportunity for a fireman to participate through his pension fund. And now the private markets are kind of soaking up. In other words, uh, the VCs and other investors say, no, you don't need to go public. We want to capture all of that upside, all of those gains. So stay private longer. We'll give you the valuation you want. We'll give you the liquidity you want. And what was interesting, we were talking about Goldman the other day. Goldman is shedding its consumer business, but doubling down on the secondary business where it's buying um, or creating a marketplace in pre-IPO company shares. So the question is, are public market stocks in structural decline? And that is, are we going to see, because of mergers, uh, because of companies going out of business and because of companies waiting longer or, or just deciding not to go public, are, you know, are the public, do you need the public markets? If you can have liquidity and you can have fundraising, um, unfortunately, you don't have the same level of transparency. But if you look at the valuations of a lot of these companies, a lot of these companies, technically, the IPO was a down round. Um, so it's it's capital has shifted from the public markets to the private markets, and we're seeing what I'd call a structural shift away from the public markets to the private markets. Um, do you think that it's also possible, though, that there's an argument to be made that, you know, all of these stocks, yeah, they popped and they came down, but they're now trading at a round where they were priced at the IPO. Um, and that could be due to a lot of factors that you mentioned. Also, there's the fact that you know, the, the float on, on these IPOs is pretty small. That is the number of shares that are actually sold on the public market. So for Clavio, there were 19 million shares, Instacart, 22 million. And then you compare that to when Facebook went public and it sold nearly 450 million shares. So the floats are becoming smaller, which leads to heightened sensitivity on trading activity, which creates these exaggerated swings in the stock price. But now they're back to where they were at the IPO. So do you think there's an argument to be made here that they were just, you know, priced correctly? I don't think so. I think generally speaking, uh, and again, um, I might be wrong here, but when your stock is back to its, when it pops and it's back to your IPO, right. the initial price within a week or two weeks, I would say that's probably a negative forward-looking indicator. And if they could do it again, you know, you want to, so the bottom line is a lot of these companies are either near or are broken IPOs. Yeah. And uh, it is a branding event. And um, I mean, it's supposed to be a fundraising event, but the it's also a branding event. It sets a tone mm -hmm. for the company and the employees and the success of the company. So I I think this is basically, and, and I think the lower floats are a function of they were able to raise so much money in the private markets and also a lower float mm -hmm. creates a mismatch of demand and supply, hoping that the stock gets a pop, right? So every decision, Ed, every decision is made by, quote unquote, the decision makers. The decision makers are a small group of people who only care about the price of the stock. They don't give a shit if this company is harming people. They don't give a shit if, if they're building a lot of economic security and they have great health plans for their employees. They don't give a shit if they're saving the whales. They want to just know what series of decisions will get the share price up exactly long enough until I plan to sell and then go hang out in East Hampton and, <laughs> and upgrade from, you know, an eighth of a share to a quarter share with FlexJet. Mm -hmm. And so what do they do if they don't need the capital? They take a small number of shares out and hope that they have 12 to 15 times 
oversubscribed when they go public and that the stock pops. And the stock price is a signal. Um, I mean, these head fake valuations, Instacart was valued at 40 billion at one point in the private markets. And some of that sometimes is a head fake going into an IPO saying, oh, smart people think it's worth 40 billion, so you dumb shit investor on the retail side should should buy it at 50 billion. But by the way, all those late stage investors basically lost money on this. I mean, oh, if yeah. you invested like after haircut. the A, you're, you're, you're underwater. Yeah, I think that's yeah. right. And then, yeah. I mean, let's look at a couple of the companies. So Clavio to me, and again, armchair marketing here or pulse marketing, but sort of a level of intelligence and data on top of email and text-based marketing, yep. that feels like a winner. AI Agreed. and messaging or email growth markets, right? Uh, Oddity, granted, I'm a shareholder, so I have a bias here, but I think AI and beauty, that feels chocolate and peanut butter, champagne and cocaine. I look at Instacart, grocery and media. It's essentially a media company. A third of the revenues come from selling ads on the site. Yeah. I bet the majority of their their profits, if not 110% of their profits, come from the media side. So you have media and you have um, grocery delivery, and 40% of their uh, transaction volume comes from just three grocers where they're Instacarting or whatever those folks are called. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, this thing just feels vulnerable and in a shitty business and trading at a much greater multiple than a Kroger's who could kind of come in and make life very difficult for them or underprice them. And Amazon might get very aggressive with them. I just, I think that Instacart, I wouldn't want to get near that thing, even though it's kind of trading where it is. And then yeah. ARM is, you know, is semiconductors. Who doesn't love that? I just think the valuation was kind of crazy. The valuation sort of implies, as as does NVIDIA, quite frankly, that they're going to sell the majority of the chips in phones and in AI, respectively. So, it all has to be set against valuation, but the IPO market, this has been, I mean, it's a couple of things. The IPO market is, I think you'd have to say it's thawing, right? They've already raised more money than they did in 2022, where they've raised almost no money, or I think IPOs are up year to date versus 2022, which is literally a nuclear winter. But it's not, it, it the IPO market doesn't have the momentum we thought it had one or two weeks ago, because these are good companies. You know, Instacart, I think it's been profitable. It's scaling well. All the numbers are heading in the right direction. But at the end of the day, it's in the grocery business and the media business, which are both, you know, kind of difficult slash shitty businesses. Mm -hmm. And so, and these things just, they feel like they were priced. They feel like they were priced for the existing investors to get out at a good price. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't be surprised if we find out a lot of insiders. Well, I guess we'll know if they're insiders. But you got to imagine the if these folks period. were in Instacart yeah. for years and years and years, and you're down 75% at whoever the late stage investors are, that you're probably, your legs aren't that fresh. You're probably kind of ready to sell and move on. And I think mm -hmm. that's what we're seeing. Um, yeah. But yeah, you, it's, yeah, it's no doubt about it. The market isn't holding up for IPOs the way we'd hoped. I just want to heap some praise onto Clavio before we move on. I mean, yes. You mentioned, you know, we're seeing kind of, broken IPOs all over the place. Four and five IPOs are not profitable when they go public. Mm -hmm. um, but in the first half of the year, the company hit $15 million in profit. They achieved gap profitability before they went public, and they turned that into a $600 million business. So, you know, they're extremely capital efficient. Um, and I just think that's a great business, and we should give credit where it's due. The only, the only bad spots with Clavio is, one, um, it's very highly dependent on another e-commerce company, which is Spotify. Around 80% of their revenue comes from customers who use Shopify. Um, and their Shopify contract expires in 2029. So they're a little overexposed on that front. Hmm. And then what I would call the ugly side of this, which I think you'll agree with, um, is the, the shareholder structure. So the CEO, Andrew Bialecki, hmm. owns 38% of the company, mm -hmm. which is just unheard of in uh, Silicon, Valley, Silicon Valley tech startups. In addition, it, there's a dual class shareholder structure. So the founders have 10 to 1 voting power and they have a majority of the voting power as a result. So there's a risk that they have too much control over the company. And if this is a buy, then you basically need to believe you need to have extremely high conviction that you know these founders are good operators um, and they're not going to become drunk on their power. I assume you may have thoughts on on that. 
We well, said a lot there, but so first off, let's agree that Clavio is an amazing company. Um, everything has to be set against one thing, and that thing is valuation. Let's assume they do $50 million in profits this year. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. My understanding is it went out at a valuation of approximately $9 billion. Yep. So that kind of translates to a price earnings multiple of 180, which means the growth is going to have to be pretty exceptional here to grow into the PE of an industry that probably is somewhere between 15 and 25. Yeah. And I think the market just going, this is an amazing company that's probably worth five or seven billion. They're right? rewarding and, them for being good. <laughs> there, there you go. So, yeah. and you know, the same thing with Arm. Arm, my understanding is, is in like, is the, has processors in like 92% of phones. I mean, God, that's a rock and roll business, right? Mm -hmm. But the market says, okay, even, even with that gangster business strategy, it's just not worth what they're trying to charge for. And fundamentals always rear their ugly head. That's the bottom line. And then yep. around dual class shareholder structure, I love that you're thinking about corporate governance. I think corporate governance is important. I hate dual class shareholder companies. Um, they just, they drive me insane because I think accountability should be linked to ownership. And the reality is these folks have absolutely no accountability. I mean, the Salzburgers of the New York Times, I think own 2% of the company and they control it. That makes no fucking sense. That's going to lead to a series of irrational, non-shareholder driven decisions. Um, so dual class shareholder companies are like, you know what? I don't want, I want to have greater authority than my ownership. Uh, they're just inherently, and by the way, the quick history of dual class shareholder companies, they're originally, they're originally from newspaper companies because like, we don't want to be subject to the influences of outsiders who could come in and say, I hate the New York Times. I'm the Koch brothers. Let's just go spend $2 billion on 51% of it and then turn it into a Fox newspaper, right? That was the initial argument. Uh, sort of true. And then Google decided they were going to be dual class. And they'd never seen it at a tech company before. And now all these tech companies do it. And they, to talk the other side, though, the majority of analysis done by uh, financial professors or professors of finance has seen that having a dual-class shareholder company has not hurt returns. They have not underperformed the market yeah. because typically dual, the only founders that have Good. the balls to suggest we're going to be dual-class shareholder are in really yeah. hot sectors that are doing really well. So, you know, okay, Facebook or Meta and Alphabet are all dual class shareholder. And guess what? They've performed really well. All the luxury guys, the LVMH guys, the Richemonts are all dual class shareholder companies. And guess what? They've performed really well. So I, I can't stand the governance. I think it's terrible. If it were up to me, you couldn't go public with a dual class shareholder structure. I think it creates mm -hmm. all sorts of problems. But the, the reality is from a shareholder standpoint, they haven't yeah. underperformed the market. Yeah, we should get like a corporate governance professor to come on and just talk pure dual class shareholder structure. It's such an interesting topic. But let's move on to our second story. Disney shares fell 3% after the company announced its ambitious new spending plan. In the next 10 years, it will invest $60 billion in its parks and cruises business. That amount is double what Disney spent on parks and cruises over the past decade. It's also triple what Disney paid, adjusted for inflation, for Pixar, Marvel, and Lucasfilm combined. CEO Bob Iger described the parks division as Disney's, quote, key growth engine. He's already increased investment in the Paris and Hong Kong parks and plans to add three more ships to the Disney cruise line. Scott, the market didn't like this. The stock fell and it was already sitting at a nine-year low. Do you think Iger is making the right call here? So it's really interesting. I just got off a call. Um, I got to listen in on a call with some Hollywood execs talking about a project that I'm involved in. And uh, they think that the writer's strike is going to be, uh, uh, that it's going to be um, solved or they're going to come to an agreement in the next 24 hours. And, and when this just, episode goes out, by the way, that may have already happened. There you go. So yep. we're recording this on a Thursday, a Thursday evening. But I found that just, I found that really interesting. And I said, well, what's happened? They said, the biggest thing that's happened in Hollywood from kind of an emotional standpoint is not the writer's strike, but what is perceived as the absolute staggering decline of Disney. And that <laughs> is, it feels like all of a sudden Disney is kind of threatened and going away. And Disney mm. were always the smartest people in the room and just this icon of success and the kind of the, the elephant in the room. And overnight, it feels like all of a sudden they've been hobbled. 
stocks at a 10-year low, and they're trying to shed. They basically put their um, ad-supported um, cable assets, their networks and their affiliates in the front yard and said, no reasonable offer decline. Yep. Yep. I think in terms, as it relates to you know, announcing a big investment in their parks, I think it's a great move. And I think of what Peter Drucker, the economist, the actually Austrian economist who taught at the Claremont College, Claremont McKenna, I think, and the first business book I ever read, um, I think it was called Observations of a Bystander. I love that term. Anyways, uh, he said, invest in your opportunities, not your problems. And that always stuck with me. And here's the thing we've been talking about. It. I think the operating profits at the cable affiliates went from like $10 billion to four. Five and a half billion. I mean, they're off like forty six percent year on year. The parks in the last ten years have gone from two billion in profits to ten billion. Mm -hmm. And in addition, let's just look at this strategically. Look at let's look at the three businesses that kind of Disney um, plans to be in. Let's ignore let's ignore the cable assets. Let's assume they're going to be out of that business. They've basically said these things are for sale, and my guess is they're going to go in the next sixty days. But let's look at the three businesses they're going to wow. be in. Parks. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Parks. I'm sorry. I, I was just reacting to that prediction. Got it. About cable assets going in 60 days. But but c continue. Let's look at the three businesses they're probably going to be in if they shed their cable assets. Um, they're going to be in parks. They're going to be in movies or movie production. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be in streaming. Okay. Streaming. Uh, they have unbelievable assets. They were kind of rookie of the year three or four years ago, got off to a big start. The Galloway household loves the Mandalorian, WandaVision. It's hemorrhaging money because they're competing against Netflix and Apple and Amazon Prime. And everyone's playing, you know, try and follow the leader into the rabbit hole of billions of dollars of, ex of expenses. And that rabbit, that two, you know, that big eared rabbit with $17 billion ears is Netflix. All right. A growing business, but shit, it's expensive to play streaming. Let's look at movies. Very competitive. You could argue a certain amount of structural decline. Now you can feed it in. It does have synergy with your streaming company, but uh, you know, it, it's as it's, it's sexy as it is, the movie business, and as excited as we got about Oppenheimer and Barbie, it's a shitty business. It's just a difficult business, and it's getting harder and harder and harder. And then there's the parks, which is an amazing business. And who does Disney have as competition? Who they have? You could argue, okay, there's Universal, but guess what? There's no deep-pocketed, irrational investor nipping your heels there. Netflix, yeah. Amazon, and Nvidia aren't opening parks, so they sort of they don't have a monopoly on this, but they have a very strong duopoly. Nine in ten Americans who've been to a theme park or amusement park, and three quarters of people have have visited a Disney park. Eight of the 10 largest theme parks on the planet, as measured by attendance, are affiliated with Disney. And eight, I mean, here's some crazy stats. One in five Disney visitors has gone into debt for one or more of their trips to the destination because they see it as such a critical part, I think, of their kids' lives. Or they're one of those adults that's mentally ill and decides to go to the parks without their kids. Disney execs, uh, you know, they're saying they have a thousand acres of land. I mean, these things are just singular. They do an amazing job. So, but check this out, okay? I did the math. I talked to, I talked to Bob from Kansas, and I'm like, Bob, tell me about this whole VIP thing. And then they take you around in a go kart like Westworld, where they repair the 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 dead bodies at night. You go behind in the kind of bowels of Disney across all the parks, and you can hit the two or three best rides. And you literally cut the line. You're there in two minutes. You give the operator a hand signal, which they teach you if you want to go two or three times on the ride. I mean, it is really like income inequality gone apeshit. And I said to Bob, I said, Bob, how many tour guides are, do you have a day doing these VIP things? And he said, we're up to, I think he said 60. Mm. I'm like, okay, 60 times 8,000, that's a half a million dollars times, call it 300. Let me get this. You're making $150 million a year. And Bob just doesn't, can't make that much money. Bob maybe makes 500 bucks tops. 90% mm -hmm. margins, 90% margins on $150 million a year, $135 million times what a multiple of 10. This is a $1.5 billion enterprise value uh, offering. And I think they're hiring more and more of you. I mean, basically, they're LVMHing the whole goddamn place and saying the people with all the incremental income because of 
a regressive tax policy in America is we're going after the top 1%. Mm-hmm. But Disney, I think of that place, I think that literally the seventh ring of hell. That is my my least favorite day of the year. I shouldn't say my least favorite because my kids enjoy it. But those parks, there's just no getting around it. There's no park. If my kids say we have to go to a football game, we got Arsenal Ed, we got Tottenham, we got the Spurs, we got Fulham, we got all sorts of shit. Your kid wants to go to Disney. You can't mm-hmm. say, oh, we're going to Magic Mountain or King's Island. I mean, if you don't take your kid to Disney by the time they're six or seven, that's reason to call child services. <laughs> this thing is a juggernaut. And so for them to be investing here makes a ton of sense. But get this, parks accounted for 37% of Disney's overall revenue last quarter. And in the last three quarters, it accounted for 77% of its total operating profit. So agreed with you on everything. The The interesting thing is that the stock actually declined on this news. And I was tr- trying to think of some of the reasons for that. Um, and, you know, the thing that I, I think that people might be reacting to is the fact that maybe the success of the parks are dependent on the continuing production of existing strong IP, um, which... Disney has completely fallen short of in the last few years. I mean, you look at the movies they've released in the past year. Uh, Little Mermaid, reboot. Pinocchio, reboot. Uh, Lightyear, prequel. Avatar, sequel. I mean, the list goes on. Um, don't you think Disney needs to also start pulling its weight in terms of creating original iconic content like it has done for the past several decades? Or do you think it's acceptable to continue relying on its existing IP to continue to, to drive growth that they're seeing in the, at the parks? Well, this is the challenge that every CEO faces, and that is to yeah. what extent do you make forward-leaning investments that will pay off in the future versus trying to harvest profits in the short term? And essentially, there's so much short-term pressure on these guys, especially in a media market and the movie market that's gotten increasingly difficult. Yeah. And it's not just Disney. It's... Um, um, Mia put together some amazing data for me showing that in 2022, I think seven of the 10 biggest movies were not original IP. Mm. I mean, basically, it's like, okay, let's put the Batman tights on them again and call it Batman 9, you know, Batman 9, even darker Bruce Wayne, you know, or whatever. <laughs> or let's have the Joker be a fucking psychotic now. I mean, let's. <laughs> so the whole industry said, okay, we can go with something original and new. And be clear, the actors and the writers and the artists all want to do that. And the studios go, no, we'll just go with Chris Hemsworth playing Thor in Rangoon, you know, Thor 44. That's just a better bet. So, and also (laughs) the consumer isn't saying, give me independent films. You want to talk about a business that is over-invested and if you can produce a great, I mean, everything can come together, you can produce a great independent film and hopefully it only loses Hopefully it costs you three million bucks and hopefully you get one or two back. This is an incredibly hard business. And the big guys, the studios, the shareholder driven guys basically go with the tent pole, you know, men in tight strategy or think about a top gun yeah. maverick. You know, it's just all the same fucking thing. Numbers yeah. three. Look at how many Toy Stories did they did? How many Shreks did they do? And no, it's insane. So they do come up, I mean, they did come up with Frozen. Elemental got off to a slow start, but now I think did pretty well. You don't need to worry about any of this. You shouldn't even be talking about this shit because at some point you're going to have to take your kids to this stuff. And again, it's the eighth ring of hell when you have to take your kids to see. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I literally remember being in the Emoji film. And I was yeah, at like the, stuff like that. Like the Emoji film. film. <laughs> like I took my boys to see the Emoji film. Basically, you have to take your kids to see everything. And so we're in the Emoji film and we're in IPIC. And I'm like, God, this is horrible. And I say to the two of them, I'm like, you guys good? And they're like, yeah, we're fine. I go out. I pick Del Rey. Got to love it. Got to love it. They have a bar. I order one Zacapa Coke. I order two Zacapa Coke. And then it dawns <laughs> on me. And I hadn't eaten lunch. And I'm like, Jesus. And I'm like, I'm a little bit fucked up. And I thought, okay. <laughs> I'm at the movie theater with my young boys. And I'm supposed to drive home. And I'm too deep. In cocktails in a movie. I'm like, this is literally child services time. <laughs> so I rolled back into the theater and ordered some greasy food and just made sure that I was good to drive. Uh, <laughs> two hours later, of course. Uh, but anyways, that that movie was enough to like risk child services for me. I'm like, yeah. I cannot handle this. I cannot be inside this movie theater. 
Uh, so but anyways. You took them to Disneyland, so you're good. No, but Disney, <laughs> uh, have you, when's the last time you were at a Disney park? Uh, I went once when I was like maybe like seven. Yeah, so you haven't been, you haven't, so wait, you're 14 now. So you haven't been in seven years. So <laughs> there's no reason for you. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. You should just keep practicing having children. And then once you have them, <laughs> You will go to Disney. There is no reason for you to ever go to I Disney. No reason at all. But let's get back to the markets part of this program, yeah. Ed. Yeah. And let's uh, move on to our third story because we're about to run, a, run out of time here. Okay. Go ahead. FTX, the crypto exchange that collapsed a year ago, is suing the parents of founder Sam Bankman-Fried. The lawsuit accuses the parents of fraudulently transferring and misappropriating millions of dollars of company funds for their own personal gain. They allegedly use that money to buy gifts for friends, go on expensive trips, and even donate to their own Democratic super PAC. Mr. Bankman and Mrs. Freed are both tenured professors at Stanford Law School. In response to the suit, their lawyers issued a joint statement saying this was a, quote, dangerous attempt to undermine the jury process just days before their child's trial begins. Scott, it's been a long time since we discussed FTX and crypto, for that matter, we obviously can't draw any conclusions from a pending investigation, but did you have any general initial reactions to this? I just love this. I think it's hilarious. Um, I remember being at Andrew Ross Sorkin's in the New York Times deal book conference, which is an outstanding conference, and Sam Bankman Freed was doing as, oh, I just fell out of bed and slipped onto and fell on a bunch of, you know, um, you know, felony theft over and yeah. over and over again. And I, I remember thinking, and I remember Bill Ackman saying, I believe you. And I'm like, this guy's, I, I'm not, I'm not revising history. I'm like, this guy's going to jail. And clearly everyone is turning on him. And now it looks like his parents are in deep water. My favorite email they've uncovered in Discovery is that his father was pissed off that he was was going to get less than a million dollar a year. And so he CC'd Sam's mother on the email chain writing, open quote, gee, Sam, I don't know what to say here putting your mom on this. I mean, that's pulling out the big gun. When you're not paying dad seven figures and he gets really pissed off, he, he CCs mom. mom. I mean, I'll tell you, that is, I'm telling you this, that is really, as someone, you know, because you're not married yet, let me just tell you, that describes pretty much every family dynamic <laughs> perfectly. Like you do not want to bring mom, and when, you, when you want to pull the big guns out, you bring in you bring in mom, but we're talking about a thirty one year old here, and you know we the standard definition of a child is under eighteen. Mm. People are pissed off. Um, this is, I mean, I don't even know this thing is going to come and go. Crypto, I think crypto is going to come and go so fast that other than what Michael Lewis is doing on Sam Bankman Fried and the one you know Apple original scripted series will be there. I yeah. think that all of this is going to be kind of a kind of a trivia question at this point. I'm not even sure it's worth, it's kind of, it's like business porn, but I just think these That's folks right. got so caught up in in making money without thinking and thinking that they were above the law and that, oh no, this is innovation, not fraud. Oh no, yeah. this is this is crypto, not a Ponzi scheme. It's just, it, you know, it's like a, that movie with Matthew Broderick and Sean Connery and Dustin Hoffman called A Family Business where they're all criminals. Mm. It's the whole thing's beginning to smell. You used to feel really sorry for the parents, and now you're like, oh, wait, maybe the parents are the problem. <laughs> yeah. And then the other news on FTX is that this is the final week for FTX's creditors to submit a claim to get their money back. Um, obviously, FTX went into bankruptcy, bankruptcy last year. So far, $16 billion worth of customer claims have been filed. Only about 10% of them have been resolved. Um, but more importantly, when we discussed this yesterday, Scott, you casually dropped that you've spent, what, a million dollars buying those claims? Um, so could you give us the full rundown on that investing strategy, which I find fascinating? Yeah, so this is not investment advice. Um, okay. But I'm just, uh, part of this program is we want to be transparent. I find that yeah. the majority of people on financial news telling you what to do just are totally opaque as to what they are actually doing. So, yep. um, and see above, I invested in the Oddity IPO and when it ran to 55, I thought, oh, I'm gonna hold on because I like to be a long-term investor and I'm sitting here and it's at 27. Um, that's okay. Anyways, I, I feel good about the company. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I like the idea of running into the fire and mm -hmm. I have made good money in what you would call distressed assets. I do not own a single coin in um of crypto i'm on the board of ledger have, right what's that 
You never have. No, right? I've never I've never purchased yeah. a coin. I'm on the board yeah. of Ledger because I wanted to learn more about crypto. They're doing a great job. They're coming up with what I think will be sort of the Apple of digital storage called Stacks. Mm -hmm. But but I've never I've just never I I'm a crypto bear and I think I think the evidence shows that that's true. However, however, you can go out now. So FTX has gone bankrupt, and now it's up to the court administrator to try and uncover all of the different all of the different assets hidden everywhere. As a matter of fact, I think that one of the co-founders had a billion dollars and the court administrator is going to get that back or claw that back. And mm -hmm. then once they claw it all back, they pay their lawyers 100 or 200 million and then they distribute it uh, based on your ownership and based on where you are in the capital structure, et cetera. And uh, I was approached by someone who said, uh, I think this is a great investment opportunity and you can buy claims for about 25 cents on the dollar. So I've been buying claims against FTX and Celsius for about 25 or 27 cents on the dollar, thinking that and when all is said and done- what, Describe what that actually means, buying the claim, because it's, kind of, it's kind of a sure. strange, like derivative concept. Sure. So the company goes bankrupt. It had a yeah. million dollars of, of it, was a, you know, it was a brokerage technically or an exchange, and they had a million yeah. dollars of my money. And uh, they go bankrupt, and I have no access to it. I have technically a million dollar claim against FDX. Mm -hmm. And now that it's bankrupt, a court administrator is appointed, and they will go in and find out what assets are there. And if the total claims add up to 10 billion and they can find 5 billion in assets, they will then distribute 50 cents on the dollar to all the claimants. Now, it's more nuanced on that based on certain claimants have priority over others, et cetera. Yeah. But effectively, a, a claim is worth something unless the company has no assets. And this is a company that has a ton of coins. It has cash. It has uh, investments. I mean, for example, I believe, I believe they own. I think they own some of it. Is it either Nvidia? I forget what they own. They own some hot. They they co-invested in Sequoia and some companies. So yeah, there's they have a big assets. Venture portfolio. Yeah. yeah, there's assets. They have a whole venture capital portfolio. There's assets at FTX, cash, coins all sorts of shit. So for example, they have an ownership stake in Anthropic, which is going to likely be worth a lot given the given the mania around AI. Yeah. So anyways, the point is uh, people don't like th these things stink as they they should. They really have a foul stench to them. People don't want to wait for 2 or 3 years for the court administrator to work through all of this and then distribute the funds and people are running from the fire. I like this a lot. So I just bought a claim, I think there was originally a million dollar claim against FTX, and I bought it, I think, for two hundred seventy thousand dollars. And I'm willing. You want to play to your strengths. What I'm willing to go illiquid. It's going to be hard to resell. I'm yeah. willing to wait. My I have uh, no needs. I can go illiquid. I have a long term time horizon. This is something that requires both, which usually connotes a higher return. And I'm thinking, and you know, it's easy to think this way, but I'm thinking I'll get fifty or sixty cents on the dollar. For what I what I and I bought these claims at about you know twenty five or twenty seven cents. So yeah. I am buying claims uh, against bankrupt um, uh, yeah. uh, crypto platforms. Whose claim is that? Like where where do you find someone who's got a million dollar claim against FTX? Oh, they're everywhere. A hedge fund invested a million dollars or put a million dollars in there because it was buying coins or they're. Every, I mean, think about it. It was a this company had was doing billions in transaction and had all kinds of money flowing through it and all kinds of people held was it was it was a custodian for coins and people were investing and then there was Alameda which was a I guess a hedge fund so people were investing in that so there was a you know it's like if Charles Schwab went out of business tomorrow a lot of people would have a claim against Charles Schwab and how do you find that did you have was it the advisor who came to you and said hey I'm doing this claims operation? Like, how do you find the guy who has the claim? I heard about him. He's a really talented guy. He's out of Italy, kind of a lifestyle okay. guy, but he's worked at hedge funds before. And this is all he does is he tries to track down and reach out to claimants and ask yeah. them if they're interested in selling their claim. And I think there's a pretty active market in it. Again, it's sort of the secondary market. And the market, there's some price discovery and you find that, okay, claims against FTX of this type of claim are worth between X and Y. He makes an yeah. offer and then he calls me. And he says, "Do you are you interested in buying this million dollar claim for two hundred seventy thousand dollars?" And I say, "I say yes." Um, yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. but anyways, yeah, I'm making investments. I'm buying claims. Yeah. Against FTX right now. Yeah, I think looking at the court filing, there was some 
interesting statistics. Basically, the 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 court has recovered seven billion dollars worth of assets, um, and two point six billion dollars of that is cash. They also have point two billion dollars in real estate. They have this massive real estate portfolio in in the Bahamas, and then three and a half of that, three and a half billion dollars, is in crypto. And it's interesting. The bankruptcy lawyers say that the crypto assets are quote category A, which basically means it's liquid, it's secure. And I sort of assumed, okay, that, that probably means that they have a bunch of Bitcoin and Ethereum. But then I, I looked at the actual court filing and actually Bitcoin and Ethereum only account for 20% of that pool of category A assets, which are supposedly liquid. The rest are all these coins you've never heard of, like XRP coin, APT coin, Tether coin, just crazy coins. Um, in other words, you've got two and a half billion dollars worth of tokens that, in my view, are not liquid at all. Because if you tr tried to sell two point five billion dollars worth of XRP token, whatever that is, you'd completely tank the price because there's just not enough. There's just not enough out there. So I think what will be interesting to look at as you, this trade unfolds for you is um, how are they actually going to sell all of those tokens? Because they can't do it all in one go. They're going to have to probably do some savvy method, selling selling the stakes in little slices over time, so that they don't tank the price of those of those tokens and and lose out on the investment. So I think that'll be an interesting thing to watch out for. Okay, Scott, let's take a look at the week ahead. We'll see earnings from Nike, and we'll also see the personal consumption expenditures index for August. Do you have any predictions for us? I think Disney is going to overperform or Disney stock. It's at a 10-year low. It's been beaten up pretty badly. Uh, its price to sales is 1.7 versus 5.4 Netflix, 1.5 at Warner Brothers, which doesn't, in my opinion, have nearly the assets or the business that Disney does. Uh, Comcast at 1.6. I think this is um, a company that's going to overperform. And my other prediction is that the rider strike uh, comes to an end in the next 48 or 72 hours. Thank you for watching this version of Prop G Markets. Check out our pod feed for office hours on Wednesday, and we'll be back with a fresh take on markets every Monday.